Welcome back to the First Gnostic Church of Christ. We are reading the Gospel according to Philip, and we are now on video number 13. And as usual, I'll be picking up from where we left off and providing my commentary. In the last video, we talked about spiritual love. People who are anointed themselves with it enjoy it. It isn't just the person that's giving spiritual love that enjoys the giving of the spiritual love, but it's also those that's receiving of that love, that's enjoying the presence of those who emanate love, spiritual love. Philip even goes further to say that when that spiritual person leaves the room, the rest of the people who don't understand gnosis and spiritual love lose their sense of enjoyment and they're left with their own bad odor. What Philip is doing, he's reminding us, it is us, those that carry the light of God and Christ, within us, the Sophia and the Mother, that bring hope to this dark realm. This is the great lesson that we must understand in order to follow the path of Christ. Recall that Christ gave one commandment and one commandment only, and that was to love. He said that all commandments are under that one commandment. And in fact, there is only one commandment, and that is to love. In this video, we're going to build on that understanding of what is this thing called spiritual love, and how does it manifest in this realm? Why does it make so much difference? But before we start our read and commentary, I wanted to take a moment to thank everyone that has left behind really great comments. Here is one of those comments I'd like to share, because I think it epitomizes the essence of this idea called spiritual love. This is taken from the last video titled, What is Sin? How to Share Gnosis. That's video 12, Gospel of Philip. And one of the subscribers here, his name is Harry, he writes, he loved this section. It really showed us the power of love. When we finally come to know ourselves, we will know love, for that is what we truly are. That's very profound, that sentence. That, in fact, is the essence of spiritual love. So, Harry, I really appreciate you leaving this comment because it really succinctly says what Philip was sharing with us. Ultimately, that in the end, knowing ourselves, we come to understand that the essence of who we are is love. Not only are we loved, but we're loved by God who emanated us. And our very purpose is to emanate love. And he goes on and says, I think that is why they say you will find God in our heart and not with our mind and thoughts. And that's exactly right. Thoughts are that thing that often brings forth division because it wants to measure, it wants to observe and take account of and oftentimes to control. So thought led unbridled or t not tamed can become ego that goes out of control. So that's absolutely true. But at the same time, it's the very thoughts that are the essence of everything. It's the beginning of everything. It was the first motion of the monad and it became known as the founder or also known as the father. That first thought was the father. And the vessel that contained that thought, that carried out that thought, was the mother. And then here Harry says, our minds always have that element of doubt. As long as we have this doubt in our mind, we will not come to know ourselves. Gnosis seems to use knowledge, truth, to wear down this doubt. And that's true. The universe is always bringing you Gnosis to show you that the essence of the universe is truth and knowledge. And it's unescapable. It's always going to be there to bring you a sense of faith and renewing of the spirit in mind. So it's wearing down doubt. And as that happens, we begin to feel the love that's inside of us all. And our way of thinking about ourselves in this realm began to change because we are moving closer to knowing God. And that's just it. God is within all of us. As we get to know ourselves more and more and more, that love grows. It is a self-perpetuating process. As we can see and feel how good this is, we feel more and more compelled to do it. And it is exactly that. It is a wonderful feeling. In the way that Philip described it, he called it ointment and wine. So drinking of the wine is light lightening the mind of the cares and worries of the world. And then the ointment is the healing process. This compulsion is what is strengthening our will. That is what is going to bring forth growing of that spiritual nature, is continually giving more and more love, reinforces itself. And Harry continues and says, our will is what drives our desires intent. That's true. In fact, it's motivation, intent, ultimately is motivation and wills behind desire and intent. And that 
it is ultimately what we are going to judge ourselves for because we're going to judge the outcome of what we're trying to strive for based upon what we originally intended or willed or were moved by that's what matters most so eventually our own desire will be to know ourselves and become one with god i think that is why practicing silent meditation is a very effective way to bring us closer to god in different schools of gnostic thought there are different understandings of the practice of meditation some people do believe in med- actual meditation yoga so forth and so on and then other schools of thought are more conservative and believe that christ uses prayer as a type of meditation or media We get the word mediate from meditation from the word mediate or medium. So definitely one way to tap into the universal truth is to go into a place where the infinite can reside, and that's the silent spaces. When we finally learn to quiet our mind and thoughts, we are also silencing doubt and everything of this realm. This is how it feels to me. I feel I am in early stages of this process, but already see the many wonderful changes it has brought into my life. So again, thank you very much for sharing that, Harry, as that I felt was one of the best comments I've seen um, that epitomized the message that Philip is trying to share with us. So thank you very much for that. Now let's go back and pick up in the Gospel of Philip under the section Children and Love. The children a woman brings forth resembles the man she loves. If it is her husband, they resemble her husband. If it is a lover, they resemble the lover. Often, if a woman must sleep with her husband, but her heart is with the lover with whom she usually has sex, the child she bears will resemble the lover. Now, we don't know whether Philip is referring to physical resemblance or personality resemblance. He doesn't clarify here. But either way, the essence of what he's saying here is what's in our heart is the child will be birthed in our personal life. It's unavoidable. We can go and marry ourselves to something else that really isn't who we are on the inside, but it's still going to birth what's really in our hearts. And you can also see how by following after or marrying yourself to something that you're not truly in love with results in a child that is somewhat illegitimate, correct? in that that brings forth a lot of emotional trauma, not only for the child, but the married partner, because the wife's mind and heart is somewhere else, and that's going to create all kinds of problems. Philip continues and says, So you who live with the Son of God do not love the world, but love the Master. The world is everything that is not you. It is everything that is the negation. The Master is within you, the Christ. You are uniquely your own Master, each one of us. We are a Christ unto ourselves, and we offer a unique perspective and contribution of the God that is. We offer it to the world as a way to heal the world through love, you see. And so do not love the world, but love the Master. In other words, don't account what the world has to say to you about who you should be or where your heart should be. Marry that thing, that that person or that situation or condition that you really truly love. Don't be partial. Don't commit to something that you're not truly 100% full of and filled with love for. This is essentially what Philip is telling us, that what you bring forth may not resemble the world, but may resemble the master. The things of the world are going to be imitations because they already exist in the world. So they're artificial. So whatever you're going to produce, if you're going to just mock the things of the world because you want to be popular or your ego or so forth and so on, you're afraid of what people will say, so forth and so on, then you're more likely to create and provide a contribution that is artificial or a mock, mock up or making something that's already there. So it's not going to be original. So this is our understanding. Now, how does this apply to the pleroma in God and so forth and so on in the world beyond is that the master that you want to love, of course, is things of the spiritual realm. You want to meditate on things that bring you a sense of non-attachment. You want to be in the world, but not of the world, as Christ always said, be in the world, but not of it. So being in the world means being realistic that you will have to follow the things of this world in order to function. The laws, you have to eat meat, so forth and so on. Flesh, you have to sleep, so forth and so on. These are things that you're bound 
by because you are a flesh being. Even Christ himself had to sleep. And there were times in the canonical text pointed out that he slept. So you see, that is being in the world. However, you don't have to be of the world. Being of the world is when you attach yourself to the outcome. You simply plant the seed, and in its due time, it will come forth. But plant the seed that is true to you and unique to you, that unique master that is within you, that wants to come out and share its unique expression of love and God to the rest of the world as a means of bringing forth that pleasant wine and perfume so that everybody may enjoy your presence. You see? So that's how he's building on children in love. Now, how does children connect back to the spiritual love again, is that we are birthing our own creations all the time. So Philip is not just talking about this idea of a man and a woman and an actual child. He's giving you a metaphor. Certainly, it can apply to a woman and a man where the woman doesn't truly love the husband she's married, and that child that she births can resemble the lover, maybe a personality, or maybe physically even. But ultimately, it's much bigger than that. He's referring to all the things that we create. We are gods, you see. We create things all the time. Even if you don't create things that are truly of your heart, you're still creating. You may be creating somewhat of a disaster, but nonetheless, you're creating. In the next section, sex and spirit. And again, when we're reading Philip, we have to understand he uses the consummation of the male and female. And that is, you can think of that in so many different ways. One of our commenters brought up the idea that it may be referring to the left and right side of the brain. One side of the brain is more logical, the other side is more creative. And the truth is, you can apply this to everything, essentially, because within all things exist these truths, you see. And so that's why Philip brings up relationships and sex and birthing and so forth and so on, the male and the female, in his writings, because they are the essence of the symbolic gesture of all things, you see. So he says here in the section, sex and spirit, humans have sex with humans, horses have sex with horses. Horses, donkeys have sex with donkeys. Members of a species have, have sex with members of the same species. So, also, spirit has intercourse with spirit. Word mingles with word. Light mingles with light. And when we're talking about spiritual things, we're talking about things that you cannot observe. You can't measure it. You can only see the fruit. And from the fruit, it either comes forth as a good fruit or a bad fruit. And of course, these are relative terms, because we don't necessarily believe in a good and bad. All things ultimately lead to gnosis and growth, and rather it be through pain and suffering or pleasure and beauty. But the spiritual things are the words that we speak, and those words, they mingle with each other, meaning that words of a kind produce words of a kind. So if you speak words that are positive, or you speak of words that support and bring forth edification, that will grow. And so also light mingles with light. And when he's talking about humans here, he's talking about that perfect human, the spiritual human. And we're going to see this as we continue down reading the rest of this section, where he says, If you become human, a human will love you. If you become spirit, spirit will unite with you. If you become word, word will have intercourse with you. If you become light, light will mingle with you. If you become one of those above, those above will rest on you. If you become a horse or donkey or bull or dog or sheep or some other animal, wild or tame, then neither human nor spirit, nor word, nor light can love you. Those above and those within cannot rest in you, and you have no part in them. So this is referring to that being that is not aware. And they're not aware of the spiritual laws. So they don't understand how words mingle with each other. And that one of the grand spiritual laws is that we manifest how we see ourselves and what we project through words, behaviors, and actions. Our emotions, our thoughts, they become reality. They become reality not necessarily always in the most obvious ways. If you continue have doubts and you think about dark things, then it will manifest in some way, ultimately, because the very universe was created through words. In the beginning, God said, let there be, and there was. John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, so forth and so on. You see, it's that is the beginning of understanding, even that separates us from the animal, is the power to use words to create our society, to create our culture. Now, certainly we have animals that have their own type of communication. We have birds that build nests. We have beavers that build homes, rabbits and small 
animals that burrow into the ground and create a little home of their own. But no animal is like a human in that it builds skyscrapers and planes that go into the air and submarines that go into the ocean. You see, these all come forth because of ideas that are in our mind and that were spoken first then was molded through model and then formed eventually. This is all the difference in the world. If we don't have language, then humans would never have created all those things, you see. It's the very language that is the very thing that brings these things about. This is what Philip wants you to understand. And the reason he's getting you to really appreciate this at the level at which he goes line by line by line by line is he wants you to understand one of the prime spiritual laws in the universe, which is that like attracts like. Whatever you spiritually put out is going to come back. That we call karma, or what Jesus says, you reap what you sow, which is really the same thing. Karma, you reap what you sow, same thing. But also, it's not only that we reap what we sow through our behaviors and our actions and what we put out. Whatever we want to attract to us, we must first become. For example, if you want to have a lover that is loyal and faithful, let's say that you're single, then you must start to practice being loyal and faithful to yourself and others. If you want a partner that isn't promiscuous and sleeping around, then you yourself have got to start doing that yourself. You've got to start prioritizing being committed to bettering yourself, you see, so forth and so on. This is really what ultimately Philip is telling you. And continuing in the next section, slave and free. People who are slaves against their will can be free. Now think about that. The only reason why it's possible for you to be free is because somebody's doing something against your will. So in other words, Philip is saying that in you is hope. Otherwise, you have no will. You would have given up the hope that you will find freedom, emancipation. That's why he says those who are slaves against their will can be free. What makes the difference here is what you believe is possible and the hope that's within you, the will within you, is what Philip really is pointing out here. It isn't what the other person's doing to you, but it's what you allow that makes you the slave. Now, of course, that's talking on a spiritual level. You have to take that within the context of all the other spiritual laws. You can't just put that aside and say, well, I'm just going to break free. And then, then, of course, the person comes and kills you. You have to be wise, right? You have to consider. Here he continues and says, people who are freed by favor of their master and then sell themselves back into slavery cannot be free again. And that's because they've given up their will. It isn't the master that sets someone free, is what Philip's telling you. But it's the person that is in slavery and bondage, keeps themselves there. We can become victims of our circumstances, of people that we feel have power over us. But ultimately, whatever we're doing, we are giving the power away. No one can have power over you unless you first allow them to take your power. This is what Philip is really saying. And in the world that we live in, most people give away their power. That's why they need authority figures. They don't want to face the truth. They want to blame others. Look at that horrible person, what they're doing to me. Look what you made me do. Look what you made me feel. No one makes you feel anything. How you look at things determines how you respond to a given condition that you're going through. And different people will respond to the same condition differently. So you can't say someone is making you something. The only ones that keeps those enslaved, enslaved are the people that have given away their power and their will to be free. Next section, farming. Farming in this world depends on four things, and a harvest is gathered and taken into the barn as a result of water, earth, air, and light. Now these are the four elements, what we call in astral theology the four elements. This is hermetical. And Philip is going to unveil some truths regarding these four elements to us coming up here. This is an example of having to open one's mind that everything you've been told that you should not be participating in. In the Old Testament, don't suffer a witch, burn her on a stake, don't practice astrology. Those are written in order to prevent you from growing in the knowledge of spiritual things. You see how Philip follows up the section called Slave and Free with farming? And then he brings forth some spiritual understanding, alchemical understanding. This isn't by accident. He's getting you to consider that secretly because in his day and age, if he spoke about it openly, they instantly would have put him on a cross. He wasn't a fool. He knew that his time was yet. So he shared this in a way that he knew those that would get it had no suit. And so these are the four elements. He continues and says, God's farming 
also depends on four things. Faith, hope, love, and knowledge. God's farming is the very essence of emanation. It's how everything comes about. The very reason you're here is to fulfill your creation, your emanation, that's unique to you. You have no other purpose. And if you were not to have that within you, then you would be basically a zombie. You would be dead, spiritually that is, and more than likely an unhappy person. Now you might have some pleasure, some lust, and so forth and so on, but you wouldn't really be happy. You re wouldn't really be filled or full and have faith and have a sense of purpose that will sustain you through good and bad. But here he says, faith is the earth. Now think about why is faith the earth. Every day that you're walking outside, you take for granted that you're not going to drift off into space. Earth itself is there for you. You don't have to think about it. You just put one foot in front of the other and it's there. And you just take it for granted. It's just there for you. Faith is the earth in which you take root. You don't even think about it. You trust it's going to be there. You see, that's faith. And earth is that element that brings you a sense of security and assurance that the world's going to provide you sustenance. It's going to protect you. It's going to be there for you. That's faith. And these are the four elements you need to bring forth anything, any creation that you may want to pursue. You have to have these four elements. They are always present in order for something to manifest. Manifest. You can't miss one, otherwise it's not going to manifest. And you could think of that as, again, a, that analogy I always bring forth, the Olympian. If the Olympian had no faith that they could ever rise to the level of an Olympian, they would never become one, would they? Hope is water with which we are nourished. In tarot, the star card is known as the hope card. And in that card, you see sometimes a man, sometimes a woman that has a water jug and there's pouring the waters of life onto the ground. This is hope. Water is always bringing us cleansing, purging, quenching our thirst, renewing the old, cleaning out the wound. This is hope. It's always there. Water is always there, always present in abundance. In fact, it's the most abundant thing on this planet. And even within you, you are mostly water. You see, hope abounds. It's everywhere. It's the most abundant spiritual truth that is emanating throughout the universe. Without hope, the universe would fall apart. The universe itself is driven by hope, for without it, it would no longer continue. The universe is expanding because it hopes to become more. This is hope. And so in the instance we're talking about the Olympian, obviously the Olympian hopes someday that he or she will become an Olympian. And it's that hope that makes the difference between who they are today and what they will become. You have to have hope if you want to become more. And if you don't have the hope within you, then think about the nature of water and watch how it's able to wind around rocks and penetrate rocks and the soil, how it's able to renew the dry land and bring forth plants. Meditate on this and in time, hope will be renewed in you. Hope is the very thing that nourishes you, you see. Next one, love is air through which we grow. Philip's telling you that the only thing that allows growth is that God stepped aside and provided us an infinite space by which we could express ourselves. Air is empty, right? It, it just allows. If you have a plant and you put it in the corner, it's only going to grow as large as the space you provide it. It can grow no larger than that. So when you have a child, you want to do the same thing. You want to provide it lots of opportunity to grow by providing it lots of space. If you want to understand how to practice love, is you practice it by allowing people space. Allow them to just become who they are. Think of a vine that go, is going everywhere. It's reaching out into the air. It's looking for something to grasp. It naturally does that. But if there were nowhere to go because there's no space, the vine would actually wilt and die. You see? So love is air. That's the element. So in the case of the Olympian, what he needs to practice is patience. For love is patience. Patience is love. That space. Patience is space, you see, because it means that the Olympian realizes time is space and space is time. He has to have patience in order for things to transpire in their natural recourse organically. And then Philip says, knowledge is the light by which we ripen. And that's gnosis. The fire is the thing that warms the soul, that brings us together in cold. We fill each other's bodies in warmth and each other's laughter in the hearth in the cold winter on a Christmas evening around the food. That's the knowledge. The knowledge is that there is light in all of us and there's truth in all of us and we share in that and in the darkness we huddle around that truth together and because of it we ripen. 
This is what Philip is saying. And then in all of these four elements, grace exists in all four ways. It is earthly, it is heavenly, the highest heaven. Grace is the essence of all these four working. It's the pranoia, conspiring in our favor. The true mother father has no hunger for judgment against you to divide you into heaven or hell, to be angry at you, to shake a fist, to put lies on your tongue, to curse you with death and pain. This isn't the true father. That's the demiurge. It's the God of the vipers, the one who introduced lies and death from the beginning that Christ talked about. You see, farming, that's the ultimate method by which we sow our seeds. And then the next section blessings on one who never grieves anyone and here when we talk about grieves we're talking about a person that burdens other people no, not talking about someone that never has sorrow if they lose someone but rather this is in the understanding that you don't pain other people blessings on one who has never grieved a soul this is jesus christ think about the fact we are now over two thousand years or close to two thousand years since the death of christ and even if he never actually walked that story is over two thousand years old and we have a holiday around it and most of the world celebrates christmas why is that because christ is what we all would like everyone else to be that person that doesn't trouble you that doesn't that judge you, that doesn't burden you, that doesn't cause you suffering. That's what Christ represents for everyone. They rep he represents that individual that we all would like to become. Not only what we would like to become, but we'd like everyone else to become. And oftentimes people will use Christ against each other. Well, you certainly aren't like a Christian. Well, you're hateful, so I'll just go over here and relate with Christ or sympathize with Christ because he sympathizes with me. So we'll go off into our little corners and this church, that church, and we'll look at each other from afar with judgmental eyes and we'll say, well, you don't get it. But Christ does. You see, that's not what it means to be a blessing. That's not what it means to not grieve others. And here he's going to tell us how to do that. This is Jesus Christ. He came to the whole world, the whole earth, and never laid a burden upon anyone. Blessings on one like this. For this is a perfect human. He told you how to become a perfect human. Philip just told you how to become a perfect human. He didn't say, don't wear a scarf in a church if you're a woman. He didn't say, don't eat that pork or that meat. He didn't say, don't gay marry. He didn't say, you know, give away all your money and go work, work in the soup kitchen. See, none of these things matter to the true mother father and the pleroma. The only way to become a perfect human is not to burden others. Now, he even will tell us the very thing you probably have in your mind. He says, the word tells us how difficult it is to bring this about. How can we accomplish such a feat? How can we give help to everyone? How is it possible that we become those people that don't burden others without burdening ourselves? How are we able to do that without carrying the cross of other people? We always have to swallow our pride and hold our tongue and be nice and kind. Now, this isn't really what Philip is telling us, but that's often what comes to our mind. And Philip's going to clarify it here for us. He says, to begin with, one must not cause grief to anyone rather great or small, unbeliever or believer. So when you see those churches out there that are castigating atheists or agnostics, they're burdening people. They're making a big cause and a scene to judge people and put laws into books to prevent you from doing this or doing that or doing this because you're ostracized or you're scapegoated as the evil sinful group. These high-minded people, these pious types, you see, they're burdening the world. There are some who profit by helping the rich. So there are those that get into the business of helping the rich. These are kind of like the lobbyists of the world, right? Because they themselves want the rich, the money themselves. They want, they want the attention, the good pat on the back. The person who does good deeds will not help the rich. This is where you start. Now think about it. In the practical sense, when you go out into the world and you have the power to vote, that's one example, where you can practice being a perfect human. Don't vo vote for politicians that are out there to help the rich. That's the very opposite of what Christ taught us. The rich don't need help. For this person will not take just anything that may be desirable. Because in other words, these rich, they got there for a reason, nine times out of ten. So if you're going to help them, 
They're going to take what you're given to them and more. You see, it says, For this person will not take just anything that may be desirable, nor can such a person cause them grief, since this person does not give them trouble. The new rich sometimes cause others grief, but the person who does good deeds does not do this. Now, this is the thing that God constantly talked about throughout the Bible, in the Old Testament included, about how people live in greed, and they steal from the poor and the hungry and the homeless and the widows. This is what ultimately angers God more than anything, if you think about the Old Testament God even, who has good in him and also evil. But God, the true Father that is filled with goodness, certainly understands that this ultimately is the essence of what brings forth attachments, is the individual that finds themselves caught up in the world of trying to get more and more money and supporting causes of more and more money. Now, there's nothing wrong with attempting to have a good life and working hard and earning things. But what Philip here is talking about, it isn't that you are doing this honorably and honestly and working hard to do it and you're earning it. That's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about here is when you go off, you ignore the poor and those that have less, the small and the great, as he says, the unbeliever and believer. It doesn't matter. You don't judge that, but you go out of your way to help those people. That is what's going to make you a perfect human. And the way to do that is not to support the causes of the rich and those that have power. You see, he says, the person who does good deeds will not help the rich. And he says, it is the wickedness of these people that causes their grief. This is what leads to suffering in this world. In other words, there's more than enough on this planet. It, we, we have an abundance of resources. And the only reason there's poverty and homelessness and sickness and death and horrible diseases is because of greed. It's because people blindly follow after the rich. They admire them. And they think that these rich people rightfully deserve what they got. When in reality, it's the opposite. Nobody has the right to take riches to the degree at which the rest of the world is suffering. Those people are causing grief to the rest of the world. This is what Philip is saying. And he says, the person with the nature of a perfect human gives joy to the good. But some people are deeply distressed by all this. People are distressed by the idea that your nature is to help others, to bring good and happiness and joy and healing to the downtrodden, the sick, the poor, the hungry, the homeless, the widow, the orphan, you see, or the animals. As Christ said, what you've done to the least of these, you've done unto me. And yet we have so much of the Christian world out there voting for politicians that support the rich and support the military. And pastors are asking for millions of dollars for jets to fly here and there and they have golden rings on their, their, their hands and big mansions. Now, again, there's nothing wrong with having a nice home having a nice, comfortable life. That's not what Philip is saying is going to prevent you from being a perfect human. What he's saying is going to prevent you from being a perfect human is supporting causes that rob other people from the riches and goodness of this world that we live in. There is more than enough. So this is where, how you can become a perfect human. All right, the last section I'm going to read in this video, a householder and food. There was a householder who had everything, children, slaves, cattle, dogs, pigs, wheat, barley, chaff, fodders, oil, meat, and acorns. The householder was wise and knew the food of each. He fed the children, baked bread and meat. He fed the slaves, oil and grain. He fed the cattle, barley, chaff, and fodder. He threw the dogs some bones. He fed the pigs, acorns, and gruel. So it is with the disciples of God. So here, again, he's building on this idea of the blessings of one who never grieves anyone, sharing. Nobody deserves to be homeless. Nobody deserves to be in the cold, without heat, an orphan, suffering, no one caring for them, not able to pay their electric bill, their power bill, or not have a roof over their heads. There's no excuse for it. We live in a world where there's more than enough, and it's very possible. The only reason why people don't choose it is because they have forgotten what Christ taught us. They've forgotten the core message of Christ. They focus on the fire and brimstone part of the Bible, and they forget the very reason Christ came here is to teach us about love, to teach us about our power to transform this planet so that it becomes as a paradise. It's within our grasp. If we but stop supporting the rich and the politicians that support the rich, that's the beginning of all, almost all the suffering on this planet. And he says, so it is with the disciples of God. If they are wise, they understand discipleship. Bodily forms will not deceive them, but they will examine the condition of each person's soul and speak appropriately with the person. In other words, judge 
judge not a person by the cover. Don't judge a book by its cover. What a person looks like, their race, how tall they are, how short they are, they have a bodily deformity, male, female, feminine, masculine. If you want to be a disciple of Christ, Philip says bodily forms will not deceive you, but you will examine the condition of each person's soul and speak appropriately to the person. You're going to speak to not what you see, but you're going to connect to their soul, their heart, and you're going to speak to that. In the world, many animals have human form. What does he mean? He's saying there are actually animals that treat other human beings better than even humans treat other humans. They're more human-like than actual humans. He says, in the world, many animals have human form. See, Philip is telling you that who you are isn't what you look like physically. That's not who you are. Who you are is the essence of who you are on the inside. And, you know, as Martin Luther King says, your character, right? If the disciples of God identify them as pigs, they feed them acorns. So, in other words, give to the individual what they want. That means don't be high-minded and think you know what's best for them. They're on their own spiritual path. You see, as the saying goes, don't throw your pearls before swine. What does this mean? It, it means essentially that feed to people what they need. When Christ came, he spoke in a language that people could hear. He followed all the laws and the prophets throughout all the world. Paganism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, all the isms, all the religions, Islam, they're all found embodied in Christ. Christ did this purposely. He said, I did this so that you may believe, and by believing, you may be saved. You see, saved from this realm, saved from your sufferings. So he did all of that. He embodied all those archetypes, purposely did it. Not because He didn't say, I did these because I have to do them, because God asked me to do them, or it's the only way for me to get into heaven, or it's the only way to please God. He didn't say that. He said, I did it for only one reason. He did it for you, so that you may believe. It wasn't a requirement for him to do them, but rather he did them so that you might believe. You see, so this is what you must do. You must speak to people heart to heart. Get to know who they are. If they're a pig, they're a pig. But don't judge them that they're a pig. Because in this world, there's places for pigs. And you just speak to them heart to heart. They need something from you. Give it to them. If the cattle, they feed like barley, chaff, and fodder. If dogs, they th then throw them some bones. If slaves, they feed them with what is preliminary. Preliminary meaning that give them hope. Set them up for hope. Preliminary, you see, the, it means like leading up to something else, right? So you're going to guide them. If children, they feed them what is complete. So if you see that they're a child of God, then you fill them with gnosis. So you're not going to go and tell everybody about gnosis, you see, because not everybody's going to understand it or appreciate it. And in some cases, it may even put you into danger. So this is the whole understanding of be wise as serpents and gentle as doves, right? So understand the condition you're in and you're going to see the world much more clearly and you're going to be less of a burden to yourself and others as a result of that. And you will become that wise housekeeper that is able to feed the world that Christ asked you to feed. This is how you do it. It's not as you have to go and sell everything you have and then go walk in the desert and walk around, you know, and sleep house to house. You see, Christ already did that. Furthermore, he was talking to his disciples at the time and he's talking metaphorically. He's saying, let go of the attachments and cares of this world and follow the things of the Spirit. And this is how you can become the perfect human. Well, you first start by not supporting the rich. Don't support the agenda of the rich. Don't support politicians that support the agenda of the rich or pastors that want $30 million jets, or celebrities that are high on a hog. You see, this is the world of materialism, you see. That's why he's talking about the rich. And even Christ talked about the rich when he said that it's more difficult for the rich man to go through an eye of a needle than a candle to go through an eye of a needle. And when we're talking about rich, we're not talking about abundance. These are two different things. Abundance is spiritual. Rich is materialistic. Rich is when you are constantly wanting more and more and more and more at the expense of everyone else. That's what brings grieving. See, it says blessings on one who has never grieved a soul, for this is Jesus Christ. You want to know how to become a Christ? Philip just told you. So when you get ready to vote, and I'm not one to tell you what party to vote for, so forth and so on. I think you are wise enough to know what you need to do. I think it's very clear the politicians you you'll need to support and those you don't want to support if you want to walk the way of Christ. And then also in your own personal life, when you meet people, what to do. Make a heart-to-heart -heart connection. Get to know them and give them what they need in the ways that you can. So that's where I'm going to leave it in this video. We'll pick up on the next section called creating and procreating in the next video. And I believe we're going to probably have about two or three videos left to complete this incredible book, The Gospel of Philip. Talk to you again soon. Bye. Bless you.